Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Very happy to be here with you this week. I have got a guest that I'm just so excited about, Ryan Wood, uh, who's a friend and colleague of mine. I've known him, Ryan, for years. Uh, Ryan is a, a very well-known UFO researcher and lecturer. He's known for his extensive work on UFO crash or UAP crash retrieval incidents. He's been involved in the field of ufology for many, many years, made many significant contributions. His most acclaimed work, I must say, is Magic Eyes Only. He's got it behind him there. Here you are right up front. By the way, the original edition of that book looked like this, but the revised and newly expanded edition looks just like that. And it's a, uh, it's one of my favorite books, has always been in this field. It is... Um, it explores, uh, well, the original version, uh, more than 70 UFO crash incidents. The new version's got more, uh, supported by very compelling evidence in the form of official documents, eyewitness accounts, and in some cases, physical evidence. Uh, I think Magic Eyes Only is one of the most authoritative uh, books ever published on the UFO subject in general, and definitely on UFO, UAP crash retrievals. Ryan also, for many years, ran the annual crash retrieval conference. I'm believing we're starting around 2004 till 2010. Correct me on that, Ryan, if I'm wrong. These were remarkable. I was part of many of them. Uh, fantastic conferences, very important. Um, and Ryan is also a business leader. He's a CEO and co-founder of a very interesting country uh, company called Electric Fusion. Maybe we can discuss that as well. Ryan, welcome to the program. Good to have you. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Richard. Yeah, I, I remember those crash retrieval conferences uh, vividly, and uh, I was so happy to help all sorts of people uh, gain a foothold in ufology from, you know, obscure crashes to people like yourself. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and, and launch a lot of people in, in, into a more robust um, engagement into ufology. Uh, you had me in there, I think, starting around 05 or sometime around that. Uh, mm -hmm. I was still pretty pretty much a new guy in the field, and I was very grateful for the opportunity. And the conferences were all uh, just outstanding. Yeah. Um, you had yeah. a lot of great, great guests. Yeah, we, uh, we, we did them in Las Vegas, and uh, I committed to doing 10, and I've done seven. So I might do more. However, I'm preoccupied with... Uh, electric fusion systems, which is uh, an effort to do uh, scalable fusion power appliances in a, in a roller bag sort of size that are, are direct to electricity approaches. It's very fundamentally different um, energy dynamic because we're lowering the cost of electricity with electric fusion by a factor of 10 to potentially 100. And that could reshape the entire globe um, as much as AI will and um, bring it to a fairer, um, you know, l less poverty prone. I mean, there's what, 3 billion people that are uh, in deep trouble with, mm -hmm. with water, food, et cetera. And, uh, you know, if you're an extraterrestrial civilization uh, popping by planet Earth, you, you would say, my God, these people are really out of control. Uh, there's no unified political authority. There's no unified treatment of humanity. Um, just on and on, you could think of all these different um, assessments that might be made. Mm -hmm. Well, I wish you uh, definitely, pardon me, definitely success on electric fusion. Uh, we we have occasionally talked about it, and I've always thought it was fascinating and, and uh, a great potential significance. So, yes, please, I hope we will all stay up to date on that. I should mention you also published uh, another book, which is behind you there, The AI Ufologist, which I have a copy of. That's an interesting book, too. Uh, maybe we can chat about that, uh, basically putting questions to AI about aspects of ufology, and it is quite interesting. Yeah, the, the way I did that uh, book is um, I, I sort of trained ChatGPT4 with uh, four or five books and some papers that I had on my computer, and then... Uh, asked it a question, you know, um, and I was surprised at the quality and sophistication of the answer. And then um, I asked it another question and then another and another. And these are all questions that I was fascinated by, um, you know, 
what's the agenda? Why are they taking humans? So why can't the government uh, be more transparent? You know, what's the national security secrets? What's the role of MJ-12? Yeah. You, you know, on and on and on. And uh, went down I, the rabbit hole with GPT. Yeah, exactly. Uh, from from crop circle technology to you know just the things that fascinated me. And 16 hours later, I was done with the book. <laughs> I love that kind of a book project. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so that was that was the and so wow I I was I was fascinated. cool. Well, let's let's I want to let's put a pen in that as someone likes to say. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. This I've got my copy of Magic Eyes only here, yeah. and I have your original. It's around here somewhere. I've read it only about a dozen times or more. Um, I will just say, um, yeah, I'm getting brownie points here. I admit it, but I have talked up Magic Eyes only to every audience that I can for years. I have uh, always considered it one of the single most important books. Here's why. Look, we're in an era now where UAP crash retrievals are being discussed out in the open. We had David Grush last summer telling Congress, yes, this is true. We've got biologics. All of that, uh, I have no doubt you're watching him thinking, yeah, tell me something I don't know. I wrote, I <laughs> literally wrote the book on this. Like you can say, yeah. I wrote the book on this uh, more than 20 years earlier uh, in an era when no one, no one was paying attention to this at all. Yeah. And you, uh, and I know you worked with your dad, uh, Dr. Bob Wood, who I adore. Uh, he's, I know, very close in your research with you, but mm -hmm. you put this together and, um, and, you know, can you, I don't want to talk about your book. I think you should talk about it. Right, right, okay. Uh, give oh. give us an overview of what, what Magic Eyes Only, then and now, uh, set out sets out to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, the impetus uh, was somebody at the Crash Retrieval Conference, uh, you know, in the early 2000s said, you know, aren't you going to be done with Crash Retrievals in another conference or two? There's, there's only like 10 of them or something. And, and I said, oh, no, there's a lot more. So I decided to write the book and really research and leverage off of uh, the work of Leonard Stringfield and the other UFO investigators. So I'm not the exclusive investigator in Roswell, for example. You you go to Stan Friedman, you go to Kevin Randall, you go to several other people that spend a lot of time with it, or Kecksburg with Stan Gordon, or it, I'm the primary investigator uh, for the Cape Girardeau 1941 UFO crash. Uh, which yeah. I spent a lot of time on. But I really assembled the confluence of the majestic documents that talk about crash retrievals starting in, in 1941 and then 42 events and then onward. Um, and then pulled together the other people and other investigators to um, round out these cases. And in the and that was the 2005 book, which had 74 crash retrieval events. Uh, which was exciting. And then uh, when Grush, uh, you know, shocked the world saying it's all real, I decided, well, it's time to update this. And uh, so I, uh, I have 104 crash events in the new version. And many of the cases were updated with the latest research from the various investigators. Fantastic. Um, and then uh, added some more ones uh, and put some of the other Stringfield ones that were... Um, you know, highlighted by Michael Schratt in his uh, work and investigations with with art and uh, and focus that you know I sort of missed. And then, as it is, I still have another ten on my desk. I just wanted to get it done um, and get it out. Uh, and they all need all sorts of additional investigation. Well, not all of them, but mm -hmm. many of them do. Um, I started with an authenticity rating uh, for each case, sort of low, medium, low, medium, medium, high, and high. And there's all sorts of metrics that go into their authenticity rating uh, from, you know, the forensics, the pink and paper, the provenance, uh, zingers, uh, content analysis, um, multiple witnesses. So there's a complicated formula that's in the book on weighting factors and so forth that begins to rank and rate um, yeah. But most of the cases are in sort of the neutral position, which means that they, the needle for authenticity could move higher if people did more research and investigation, or it could move lower for the, the same cause. And exactly. 
r recently in the book, the the Ramey Baca uh, story with Jose Padilla um, went down because Doug Johnson did a lot more research and and concluded that oh yeah, this guy's lying. He was on and on. So there, these are all. This is all good. Um, yeah, I was always very glad that you had that rating in there for each entry, and I was very happy that you retained it because it's kind of nice. Uh, people, when they get the book, they'll see what you mean. At In any uh, case here, I'll see if I can show them. Yeah. There's a little uh, dial right underneath the date of the incident. And that one, you've right. got it right up the middle, so it's neutral. But mm -hmm. some are over far to one end or the other, uh, where yeah. you know you indicate how strong you think the case is, right? And it, and it's, it's referenced and indexed. I mean, uh, I'm not trying to be the final authority. I'm sort of being the preponderance of the evidence. And here's you know, you know, Nick Pope recently said, you know, if just one of these cases turns out to be true, it, it's going to change the world. But you know, that's his perspective. Uh, and you know Jacques Vallée recently gave me a quote for for the new book and and said you know this is going to be the uh, the research tool that allows people to sort of better understand uh, the nature of um, the enigma so to speak. Um, it's interesting. Well, I don't want to go down a whole side road about Jacques Vallée, but uh, over the last several years he has definitely noticeably moved in the direction of crash retrievals. He did his own work with Paula Harris on the Trinity event, of course. Uh, you know, for years before that, pe people who remember, uh, Jacques Vallée did not necessarily put a lot of credence in crash retrieval accounts. Uh, in fact, I would say almost at all, but he's clearly, clearly moved into a different direction here. And I'm glad that he is endorsing your your work. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, and you know, I recently read you know, his little background bio, and he was one of the very earliest people into artificial intelligence yeah. um, in computer science and astronomy, writing machine learning codes in the, you know, I think it was early 80s or or even in the 70s. So, uh, and then he was a consultant on uh, Close Encounters as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Legendary. So, but you know, he's he's getting on in years, but he seems to be plugged into the Soul Foundation and what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Magic Eyes Only was yeah. an interesting um, effort. We talked a little bit about the authenticity, but central to this is um, the most powerful majestic document, uh, the Special Operations Manual, Extraterrestrial Entities, Technology, Recovery, and Disposal. Let's talk but, about this now. Let's. I want to get this um, out in the open, the majestic documents. People, not everyone understands what you mean here. So many people have heard of the MJ-12 documents. Those were uh, leaked in the 1980s, caused a huge ruckus that has not ended to this day. Those were um, seven pages on a photographic negative. Uh, the majestic documents are vastly different and greater. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you just to talk about them. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a supporter of your work on the majestic documents. And I would love for you to yeah. explain people just exactly what you mean by that. Well, that's, that's a great question. I think the first thing that people need to understand is that this is a collection of some 3,500 pages that first leaked, as you mentioned, in 1984 to, from Jamie Chandray as undeveloped film in a mailbox in L.A. Um, to uh, another leak uh, of the uh, Special Operations Manual for, via Don Berliner in 1994 as, again, Triax film. Um, mailed from La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, and then to um, Tim Cooper and various sources. But there's seven sources uh, spanning um, basically 20 plus years. There's been nothing uh, of, of real note recently. Um, and so any sort of thought that this is disinformation is just uh, pretty nonsensical because you have all these different sources, all these different documents. Some are um, 
challenging. You know, you aren't convincing anybody because there's all these issues. Uh, and some are really compelling, like the Special Operations Manual, uh, uh, Top Secret uh, mm -hmm. ma Magic. And some are with original paper and ink. Uh, like yeah, they're not all photographic negatives or digital yeah, images. Right, exactly. Pieces of the paper with ink. Yeah, like the encyclopedia. Analyzed. Right. The Encyclopedia of Flying Saucers, for example, is is real paper and ink. So you can you can look at the forensics of the ink and the pencil writing and the mm. top secret magic stamps and say it's old. And um, so it's a it's a wealth of insight that's uh, potentially um, shapes your perspective on how much government uh, interaction and when this really stuff started. Um, yeah. So, so you were you were mentioning that uh, as a way, I think, to support uh, some of your uh, work in Magic Eyes Only. If I right, and, yeah, yeah, and you know, one of the uh, a couple of the leaked documents talk about uh, 1942 uh, Los Angeles air raid crash, where one uh, crashed into the ocean and the Navy got it. And one went into the San Bernardino Mountains, um, where it was recovered. Um, by the army. And, you know, funny enough, Tim Cooper lives in the San Bernardino Mountains and Thomas Cantwell, one of the leakers of many of the majestic documents, uh, presumably lives there too, or did before he died of, mm. of cancer. Um, but, you know, he claimed to work uh, under James Jesus Angleton in the counterintelligence corps. Um, of the CIA and part of the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit. And I will just mention that the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit is not some figment of my imagination. The FOIA uh, requests have acknowledged that, yes, this is part of the uh, um, Air Force Chief of Staff, Chamberlain's uh, uh, Interplanetary mm -hmm. Phenomenon Unit. Uh, but the, the institutional memory is gone and there are no records, uh, blah, 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 sort of response from the National Archives. It's amazing that, yeah, there's an acknowledgement. When I first oh. came across that phrase years ago, I thought, this can't be real. Right. But it, it was confirmed. Right. There, it was something yeah. called the Interplanetary Phenomena Unit, uh, IPU. Yep. yep. Maybe, maybe we could even talk about that. Uh, not yeah. sure where you really want to go first. I mean, uh, I'm fascinated by all of the evidence you've amassed for Magic Eyes only in the form. This really, this is a history of, of UAP UFO crash retrievals. That's really the best way that I could describe it. Uh, it's better mm -hmm. than any other book that's ever been tried on the subject. Uh, yeah. How many of these cases, let me ask you, first of all, I think you believe in the reality of crash retrieval. That's obvious. Um, do you have an estimate as to how many you think you've got, I think maybe 15 or so that I think you rate very, very highly in here, something along those mm -hmm. lines. Uh, can you speak a little bit about some of these stronger cases and mm -hmm. uh, why you think they're so strong? And uh, yeah. well, and maybe we can get into, you know, what you think is the ultimate reality behind the whole crash retrieval phenomenon, how it works. What are your thoughts about it? I know that's a pretty open-ended mm -hmm. question. Yeah, it's, it's well, um, I mean, I have 104 cases here in this book and a few more on my desk, but it's biased into uh, the United States and Europe and English speaking environments. And I'm sure there's more in um, in Russia and China and South America and, and, and Africa. Uh, so I think the the real number is probably double or triple. Um, that wow. and so there's a lot more you know bodies that people ask well why did they crash you know that's just like it was one of the senators um or, or excuse me congressman that said you know i'm from missouri and like how can these advanced civilizations you know just screw up so badly and crash in our podunk planet and and grush said well you know, there's a certain number of sorties that end in mission failure. And um, but my response is, um, you, you know, you can't discount a, a large negative lightning bolt, which is millions of amps and, and millions of, of volts 
uh, interrupting their, their craft in the Roswell, New Mexico uh, environments, um, or uh, that we try to shoot them down with uh, the LA case with anti-aircraft uh, mm -hmm. you know, or radar interfering with their systems uh, before they figured out that, oh, well, we got to deal with that. Um, or the biological robot, you know, these are biological entities that are just um, engineered to explore the cosmos and they're on one-way missions to gather info. Um, and, you know, hey, What's I'm out of fuel. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, Right. I put my information back into the system. Uh, well, you know, we have this idea, like imagine if we were to go back in time and, and speak to people of uh, ancient Greece uh, and we said, yeah, we have airplanes and helicopters. We're pretty advanced. And they'd be like, wow, that's amazing. You must never have accidents. You must never crash. <laughs> so we, you know, right. we're, we're way more advanced than, than they were, but it doesn't mean that we're perfect. And why would we assume perfection from a civilization that's even more advanced? technologically than us. Right. Or, or um, uh, it, it might be more biologic. The craft is sort of a hybrid uh, mechanical biological um, uh, entity. Mm -hmm. So it can self-repair or um, it, it, it interfaces with the biological occupants as well. So, I mean, your question is, is really broad. There's a lot of crash retrievals that have, have happened. There's, uh, you know, I'm 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 not sure where else to to go with your, your yeah. Program. I'm sorry, I, I probably no? okay. slipped it too too far open. But um, well, let's talk a little bit about Cape Girardeau since you have focused on that okay. so much, and I know that you know Charlotte Mann, who's the primary source on that quite well. Um, I have spoken with Charlotte a number of times, and and she's just oh. wonderful. Uh, but you really have gone into that case. And I think that's actually a very important case just because it's 1941. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's six years before Roswell. And it, it right. would indicate, if true, there was a whole system well in place by the time Roswell came along, or, or Trinity, if we want to go there with, uh, you know, the work that Jacques Vallée and Paula Harris just did. What, what, yeah. what would you like to say about uh, Cape Girardeau? Well, I mean, Cape Girardeau is an interesting sort of microcosm of, of how you investigate a, a crash retrieval case. And people often ask, you know, well, how do you do it? I mean, it's um, so in, in this particular case, we, we had the um, uh, one of the majestic documents mentions the um, Reverend Huffman, 1941, uh, or Cape Girardeau case. And um, actually, Stan Friedman was one of the people that originally found or heard of Charlotte Mann and his um, and her testimony. And so um, the story goes that Reverend Huffman, who was the Baptist minister on Main Street in Cape Girardeau, um, was uh, taken out by police, called out to provide blessings to uh, three dead aliens, uh, and he, he did that, and the police and military showed up and swore everybody to secrecy and took all the bodies off to Sykeston um, Airfield at the time, which was a, a training base uh, for pilots. Um, and it sort of all was, was quiet then, um, and this testimony comes to Charlotte Mann, uh, the granddaughter of Reverend Huffman from uh, Flo Huffman, the wife of Reverend Huffman's uh, deathbed confession, uh, mm -hmm. and fills in a lot of details uh, to her. So we have, I mean, admittedly secondhand testimony um, from Flo Huffman to Charlotte. We have the document. Uh, and my investigations went to, uh, well, let's go to Cape Girardeau and look at the uh, fire fire station logs from 1941. See, well, where did, where did the fire department go? Because they were called out to the scene. Uh, and so mm -hmm. you can get the, the logs uh, there of the fire department. Uh, and you can go to the Baptist church and look at the records there and show that, yeah, Reverend Huffman was and where he lived and, uh, and so forth. And then ultimately, 
you want to know the, the two major challenges with any crash retrieval is precisely when and precisely where. Mm -hmm. And those, if you can get those things down, you can really open up the, um, the investigation. And so that's, that was the goal of going to the National Archives and doing historical aerial photography comparisons between, you know, 1939 overflights of Cape Girardeau um, and 1943 overflights and looking for differences. Well, wh see. where's where's the land disturbed? Where I mean, we knew it was a 15 minute drive outside of uh, Cape Girardeau, and we knew it was either the spring or uh, fall because it was sweater weather. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Anyway, those are types of things that you end up doing to further investigate. And then I sort of stopped and Paul Blake Smith continued on with the investigation and sort of become the, uh, the follow on investigator. Um, and he wrote a book on uh, uh, Missouri 41. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's sort of a, you know, how you go about investigating that particular case. But everyone is sort of different. Did you find anything? I, I actually don't recall what your conclusion was uh, or your investigation on Cape Girardeau just un, uncovered. Did you uncover changes in the geography or topography or did um, you find any other interesting clues? I wonder. Yes, there was a couple of spots that were um, anomalous that were worth investigation. One turned into a, uh, a housing tract um, and you can't sort of go there and find out because it's all been leveled and houses. So you're, you're looking for artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then you look at the people too. Um, Cape Girardeau is the home of Rush Limbaugh um, and Rush Limbaugh Sr., who is mm -hmm. very much the in, involved in the entire um, process and trajectory of it. And, and somebody called Rush Limbaugh when he was still live on his radio station and said, you know, have you heard about this Cape Girardeau UFO crash? And he hemmed and hawed and sort of said, there's a lot more to this than uh, meets the eye. No kidding. Um, yeah. And sort of subtly acknowledged it, um, but didn't really go into the details because his father, no doubt, probably told him a, a lot about it because it was a, a small town. Um, and, he, he, you know, he was, I think he was on the city council or the mayor and certainly one of the uh, stalwarts of the ah. town. Interesting. Um, yeah. So it was like, that's sort of fun. And I think I have it as a medium high quality, um, not as, as high as Roswell, where you have a lot more documents and a sure. lot more evidence, or Kecksburg um, with a lot more research. Uh, but I just I think. Think, I don't want to, uh, we yeah. can move on, but I just think uh, relating to the Cape Girardeau event. Uh, it's true. Like we only have really the one witness, Charlotte, and she is the granddaughter. It's true. However, uh, people can probably find video of her out uh, on YouTube. Oh, yeah. I know she's there. Uh, you talk to Charlotte for even five minutes and you know you've got a person of scrupulous honesty, conscientiousness. There's no question about any of that. There's no question that she's honestly telling what her grandmother told her. Yeah. And uh, it's hard not to believe Charlotte. Yes. When, when you talk with her. Yeah. And and it was the subject of a MUFON conference um, talk that I gave, uh, I don't know, in like in the two, late 2000s, I think. Or uh, So there's conference proceedings and there's her video testimony. But yeah, it, it's it's one of the, the good ones. Um, mm -hmm. You, you yeah. don't know. No, go, go on. Um, it, it's difficult to know what to make of it all. I mean, the, the crash retrieval scenario is pretty uniform, is that it crashes. Sometimes there's bodies. Sometimes there's not. The military takes it all away. There's some witnesses and some documents. And, uh, you know, one time at the crash retrieval conferences, I had um, uh, an aviation uh, archaeologist come and talk about uh, airplane crashes and what he found. And for example, um, there was a Bakersfield stealth fighter crash that um, uh, that he had been to and pulled all sorts of parts off the hillside, despite the military coming in and cleaning it all up. Mm -hmm. Long before stealth fighters were 
you know, in the public domain. Yeah. So they can't really clean it all up. Uh, and uh, didn't somebody just find a, something anomalous in the desert of Roswell? Um, a little tiny stone with a fancy uh, symbols on it or something like I'm that. I'm not sure that I heard this, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, well, and so it's out there. You, you just were making me think. I mean, there's a number of things that come through loud and clear in your research. Uh, that is a, a kind of consistency that runs through many of these cases. A, a number of them are multiple witness uh, accounts, not all, uh, but but uh, some of them are. What you definitely find are uh, is a consistency of accounts, like uh, the description of the craft or the recovery process or the subsequent uh, secrecy over it. Like all, all of it's very consistent. Uh, there are times when there's a fair amount of technical accuracy, technical details provided by the witness concerning uh, different operations and procedures. Um, it just all suggests to me that these people are, are certainly not fabricating their stories. We do have some instances of physical evidence or alleged physical evidence, I guess I should say. Um, all of that strikes me as uh, relevant to the discussion. Uh, and we also, it, there are some other government documents. Not all of them are leaked majestic documents. There are some documents in FOIA that do indicate U.S. government interest in uh, downed exotic technology. Um, yeah. We have one from Bolivia in 1978. And I know there's a bunch of others. Um, yeah. So Those I just, yeah, all of that to me strikes me as, as relevant in this. And I'm sure you, you can say a lot about that as well, having gone through yeah. all of these cases. Right. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, many of the cases are, are the source documentation is, is public released FOIA documents on, on project moon dust or, you know, moon dust was primarily let's pick up Soviet space junk uh, and and send it back for analysis. But not exclusively, right? That's right. Not exclusively. Not exclusively. Please, please discuss this. I think a lot yeah. of people don't know about and, Project moon dust. Yeah, uh, moon dust, and um, I think it's still an active uh, uh, program today. Uh, but every once in a while, the teams recovering stuff that came out of the sky or the atmosphere wasn't Soviet space junk. It was ET craft or artifacts, and they carted it off and sent it to Wright Patterson. Um, yeah. And so we know about Moondust. There is a, a, a declassified document, I think from 1961 or 1960, that describes Project Moondust. It describes the types of art, uh, artifacts that it's charged with recovering. And I think one of the entries is unidentified flying objects, um, I believe. Yeah. I think it's and, in, and, as distinct from Soviet satellites and the like. Right. Uh, and th there's, um, I, mean, I think uh, there was a whole book written on Project Moondust uh, long ago. I think it needs to be updated. I, I think uh, I had a uh, Randall, I think, wrote yeah, it. Yeah, Kevin Randall. Yeah. Kevin Randall. Um, uh, I had a personal experience where I called Aerospace Corporation Um in Pasadena and um, said, I wanted you to analyze uh, some crashed uh, hardware that I've recovered um, and, you know, mentioned moon dust. And the guy said, well, uh, let's schedule another call um, to talk about this more. And I said, okay, fine. And so uh, I did that. And lo and behold, there was two guys on the phone this time, uh, no doubt the security officer uh, and this you know, uh, scientist. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, well, various investigation techniques about how you could do this, what, you know, what it would cost and, and so forth, uh, sort of a business thing. Um, but it was pretty clear that it was still an active moon dust program uh, at the time. And, you know, if Congress wants to get into it, um, find and declassify all the moon dust documents um, and that program. And they'll get space junk, but they'll find other things and another door. It's true. No one has been talking about moon dust over the last year in the public realm. I haven't heard any reference to this. Right. And um, you make a really good point because when when you were holding the crash retrieval conferences, we're talking now 15 years ago. <laughs> 15 years. Um, but, but moon dust came up a lot. I recall this uh, very well. Um, this was something that was very much talked about. 
Uh, and because there is uh, some of a FOIA trail for for Project Moon Dust, like it's it's confirmed, and right. I'm not hearing anyone talk about it now. And I think that's a, a very good opportunity. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, the the other thing is that you know when I was listening to the UAP congressional investigation, and one of the center se senator or not senators, but congressmen asked a question about. Well, can you give me any specifics on where I could find documentation or source material about this? And and Grush sort of said, I'll send you to a skiff. I'll tell you all this stuff in top secret closed door. And my response would have been record group 341, entry 47, folder 22. Uh, and here's a document that describes uh, crashed bodies uh, and 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 the UFO event that's too bizarre to believe. Um, and I mean, it's not a smoking gun, but it's more smoldering. Um, and there's a bunch of documents that are right out of the National Archives. Are you referring are, to a specific document when you just said yeah, that? And, exactly, and if so, what were yeah. you referring to? Well, I, I can, I'll email it to you. Um, so it's a, it's a one pager that uh, was a correspondence between Robley Evans uh, and somebody in Wright Patterson Air Force Base, or okay. um, about a top secret um, document. Um, so there are many examples of that that I got out of the National Archives. I think you went with us once to the National Archives. I did, yes, yeah, we had a, um, we had a great experience there. Yeah, and there are, I mean, it's almost a whole book. You know, I wish somebody would get motivated or excited about it, just to say evidence from the archives and. If the congressmen really want to know more about this, give me five people with top secret Q clearances uh, and three and four months in the National Archives, and I can give you a stack of paper that gives you. Uh, um, a okay, story. well, we need we need a uh, a single compendium, don't you think? Yeah, of those documents, uh, you. This is another project for you, Ryan. I'm sorry, but you're the best person to do this. You know well, where you've got the receipts and you can probably gather them together. Uh, right. I think that would actually be a fantastic thing. Well, uh, yeah. You know, officially rec uh, recognize U.S. government documents that yeah. uh, test yeah. to UAP crash retrievals. Right. I mean, the the challenge is that you get, you get snippets, stories, supporting evidence, um, around a more uh, stunning majestic document um, from the National Archives and and sort of and uh, of course all sorts of withdrawal slips that to say you know hey this is withdrawn top secret um, and get it declassified um, so it, there is a lot of evidence uh, out there um, and hopefully Congress will do another uh, event um, and, and look at this closer. Well, there's there's definitely um, things brewing in the background. I'm aware of this. And the word is that there at least is some desire for additional hearings. I do hope that that happens. Uh, how far that will go is anyone's guess. But yeah. uh, I think it would be nice if we were to, to see that happen. Uh, and your your book really needs to be part of this conversation. It seems to me it's um, uh, and you know you I think you justly point out. Look, I don't know if every single case in here is exactly a slam dunk. Uh, that isn't the point. The point is to put the evidence out there. Uh, but there are a number of cases that are quite strong. Yeah, quite strong indeed. And uh, and you make the case, I think, very very well. Yeah, so the, it's important. The the thing that um, could be focused on, and, and and others have focused on it before, is the Special Operations Manual, where we've done so much work around the content and the the typesetting and interviewing people that were in the government printing office and how. Yeah, yeah the uh, authenticity of, of that particular document stacks up. And, and my work on the, the provenance um, 
It was stamped Kirkland Air Force Base, Unit KB-88, uh, and the, the change control page where the officers are responsible for changing out certain pages as they uh, change and evolve over time. I'm going to ask uh, you to describe this this document again. And by the way, I'm going to have a link to it to your website, majesticdocuments.com, where people can examine all of these documents. Sure. I think that is important. But can you just yeah. describe the SOM 101 for people? Because not everyone is on board. There's a lot of new people yeah. who come to the field in the last five years. They don't know about this document. Yeah. Well, it's a... Um, a typeset document was leaked, uh, leaked as um, uh, film, uh, undeveloped film to Don Berliner, mailed from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, but it's uh, it's a how-to manual. It's a it's sort of training the recovery soldiers on how to retrieve crash retrieval, uh, you know, situations from where do you take the alien bodies? How do you pack them up? Where do you send the power plants? Where do you send the um, the crash hardware? Where do you send the weapons? There's a whole page uh, that describes the various packaging techniques and where they go. Most of them go to Area 51 S4, but some of them go to Wright Patterson's Blue Lab, which has been uh, sort of acknowledged that mm -hmm. exists um, and and the most mysterious one is uh, OPNAC uh, BBS04, which I think stands for Bronx Biological Station, um, for Dietlift Bronx, uh, famous uh, surgeon um, mm -hmm. that was plugged into this. But it's it's very much a how-to manual of. You know, well, why are we doing this? How do we do this? How do we coordinate? There's, there's advice, the there's articles on crowd control and media management as well. Right. Good point. How to handle yeah. the public, how to keep people quiet. Right. And and some of the things that say, well, tell them it's a down satellite um, and keep away. And some people said, well, that's, it's a fake because in 1954, when this was published, uh, you know, we hadn't flown a satellite. But when you look at the popular press, like in um, Time Magazine and so forth, in '53, um, it, it was all over the front page that you know artificial satellites were were coming. Um, so it was talking about then, mystery satellites all throughout that year. Yeah, and and then the the big thing for me, which is what the FBI would say, is well, the change control. Who who was responsible for? for updating this manual. And there was two guys, two initials in this manual, uh, EWL and JRT. And I found them in the Albuquerque phone book. And they're both officers on perimeter road inside Kirkland Air Force Base. And so you you, you have the names. I have their DD-214s and their, their military records. And they're both dead. But nevertheless, it all hangs together. I was not aware of that part. That's That's yeah. really... Right. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so from that point of view, and then you have the content uh, things, you know, screwdriver is two words instead of one word, mm -hmm. which is the modern day. And, you know, this is 1994. This is this is back when computers barely had word or court. 94 when the doc, when the film was released. With yeah, the, was, was found. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and you have fingers of the guy holding the pages open and you can do forensic analysis on. And it's uh, obvious that that book was, I mean, the film was from 94, but the, but the book, or the manual is from uh, obviously. The 54. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so it's, it's very stunning. This, I mean, you could do a couple hour lecture on that. Uh, document alone. And if you say, okay, that's the only thing I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe this one document. You have to realize that there's multiple crashes. There's alien bodies. There's weapons. There's uh, hardware. There's uh, power plants. There's, there's all sorts of science um, that can be reverse engineered. And um, that's that's one of the key majestic documents that's in the book magic eyes only in the back is an appendium and it's mentioned in the the front as an introduction 
aspect as well as authenticity. But many of these cases are, um, uh, are, are, are updated from various uh, investigators. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's quite quite valuable. I'm glad we talked about the, the special operations manual. It doesn't get a lot of attention even today among the UFO research community. I think many researchers still instinctively will say hoax. It's a hoax. It's related to the MJ-12 hoax. Philip Class proved it. You know, the New York <laughs> Times, you know, whatever they want to say. Um, they're, they're, MJ-12 has been such a divisive uh, matter since it appeared uh almost 40 years ago my god mm -hmm. uh but yeah one you can argue back and forth about those uh the mj12 documents uh, fine uh people do but i've always been impressed by the majestic documents that you and your dad collected i remember uh 20 plus years ago when i was quite new in this field i i'd known about those documents uh, and I was terrified. I'll be perfectly honest. I was terrified to get into it uh, because I thought this is just a big, this is a, a huge, uh, you know, controversy here. And I didn't yeah. want to deal with it. But eventually I did. And and uh, what I ended up doing back then, I went to your website and I printed off because you had nicely everything in a PDF form. I printed every single document you had and I bound them together mm -hmm. into one uh, I comb bound the book together and that became my book. And I read, I read each one chronologically uh, in order, uh, took a while. And by the time I was done, I thought there is no way in hell this is a fake. No way. I'm yeah. sorry. I can't. Uh, could some of them be disinfo? Uh, sure. Okay. But when you think about them, it's like this thick mm -hmm. when you print them all out, it's, it's incredible. And uh, the 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 time periods vary over the decades. The writing styles are different. The typefaces are different, but the language seems very consistent. It seems very accurate for how it uh, was meant to be. You would have to have teams, large teams of PhDs in all kinds of areas to coordinate and to create this as one fake document for who for the ufo community just to have us chasing our tail <laughs> back in the 90s yeah right exactly uh, I, i'm no no sale not by yeah. and, and and you you bring up an excellent point uh and and in magic eyes only um i wrote a whole chapter about a psychological warfare in the majestic documents and j just to review the psychological warfare is sort of fancy term for for marketing um and so you you really want to tell people the truth again and again and again, and then slip them a lie. And mm -hmm. it, the sort of scenario, that's what the, the spies are trying to do. They're trying to develop yeah. sources and, and then insert a lie or uh, some sort of, of target. And yeah. given the time frame, the multiple sources, the um, low quality and high quality, um, it's difficult to believe how anybody um, would trust um, this collection um, completely as a as some sort of disinformation ploy. For for what end? I mean, you know, don't mess with the U.S. because we have ET technology that'll fry your ass. Uh, and and who's that a message for? Is that a message for China? Is it a message the Russians? For Russians. Presumably. Right. Well, it's not going to work if the Russians knew that UFOs were nonsense. Obviously, that's the <laughs> first point to make. The right. Russians, or they, they have their own crash retrievals. Yeah, well, say whatever you want about them, but they're not dummies. And they right. have brilliant scientists and they've been on top of this just like the Americans have yeah. for years. So, yeah, I've thought the same thing. If, if the majestic documents were intended as dis disinfo against the Soviets yeah. or the Russians, the question is, how's that going to work? Like disinfo, as you just said, is only going to work if that you have mostly truth in there. It's right. not. It's no one's going to be convinced if it's right. lies from beginning to end. That's that doesn't right. work as disinfo. You've got right. to feed false information in. So even if there, if that were the case, I've always felt that the majestic documents still support the reality of uh, this yeah. deep, deep uh, UFO right. system, system. Yeah. Yeah. And just uh, on that so basis. I so what, once you get over those sorts of 
uh, thoughts about you know it's it's all fake or disinformation and so forth you're you're left with that uncomfortable truth that this could be real and now validated by uh grush um and his commentary and and now you know he's naming names cooperative and uncooperative inside a top secret skiff with corporations you know uh, and there's now a hundred more people with uh, high-powered tickets uh, to classified information that know more of the truth. Um, but you know, to me, it all boils down to, well, now what? You know, I'm reminded of the end of uh, Nemo when the people are uh, the fish are going to the sea at the end, and and they say, now what? Well, what, what the hell will she do now? Um, and so it's all about technology in my mind. It's like, how do we do fusion? How do we do anti-gravity? How do we leverage the technology to elevate humanity uh, mm -hmm. and bring it up? I mean, Einstein and Oppenheimer uh, in one of the majestic documents in 47, were talking about this exact thing in front of the United Nations and in this, this leaked document. You know, how do we elevate everybody up to a fairer, uh, happier world? Um, mm -hmm. And it's unclear. Um, and the only way to do it is to uh, sort of bite the bullet and, and change things in a fundamental way. And yeah, this is what you're trying to do. So, right. I, I mean, it's actually, it's kind of really neat. You're, you've segued, in a sense, from studying the the phenomenon of, of acquired UFO tech, which in, inclu includes many revolutionary developments, including energy. And now here you are with electric fusion working on that. So maybe in the last five minutes or so that we have, you can describe yeah. that effort. Yeah. I mean, um, the key fusion, there's a lot of there's 30, 40 companies working on fusion in the world. Um, from giant efforts, uh, an eater in in Europe with, you know, hundreds, well, tens of billions of dollars in scientists and efforts and so forth. But they they're lacking the tritium fuel. And even if they were successful in doing fusion, it would run for a few hours and then be done. You know, so it, it, until you can do something that is. Um, super low cost and super abundant. Other technologies uh, use helium-3. You know, uh, they talk about mining the moon for helium-3 to do fusion mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. And you can do that. But last time I checked, helium-3 is $2,000 a gaseous liter, which puts the cost of electricity through the roof, let alone all the technology and so forth. So our approach at Electric Fusion is we use lithium, metal, $20 a kilogram, uh, ammonia, uh, which off the shelf, it's like water, it's free, and and noble gases uh, like xenon and krypton, uh, which you get recycled. And this creates a, um, a very fusible environment with a lowered Coulomb barrier and and frustrated electron tunneling and all these terms that people don't haven't heard about that are in the fusion science world. Um, so and Rydberg matter, which is something which is interesting. Um, Rydberg matter, it's in Wikipedia. It, it's also the basis of what some people call dark matter in space is that one of the theories of, of dark matter in the universe or dark energy is it's actually Rydberg matter, which happens to be uh, an atom with a very high electron orbital way, way out. Um, it's, it's a sort of a different uh, type of atomic structure, uh, which makes it much easier to fuse. But uh, that's that's what I've been decided that's important to work on um, from a humanity point of view. And, and because you can't, I think some of the technology that from the crash UFOs has leaked out into various patents and organizations and science uh, slowly in um, in an unfair way because no doubt it's it's through E.G. and G. or Bechtel or 
uh, Boeing or Lockheed or all these classified projects mm -hmm. that they have some insights or technology. Um, and I think I, I mentioned to you that, you know, there's really three types of information in the world. There's the white world, which is normal science and education, universities, et cetera. We can find it on Google Scholar. There's the classified world, which is top secret, very compartmentalized uh, science, compartmentalized patents. And then the proprietary world, the trade secret world that um, that is where I think anti-gravity is right now is that you don't want to the real secrets seem to be outside the control of the government. Which is, yeah. Yeah. Which is what Gorish said. He said, you know, or one of the other testifiers that you got to know where to knock yeah, on the right yeah. door. Yeah. said this. Uh, I talked several years ago to Dr. Kit Green. I did an interview with him quite extensively. He said the exact same thing to me. It's all corporate. Uh, the highest level scientists, the best scientists, they're all corporate. Uh, and they get the best clearances as well. When you leave uh, federal government, federal work, you go into private industry, it just gets better and deeper. And I think many others have said the same thing. Yeah. So. But you're you're working, uh, you know, just to close it here, you're working on an energy breakthrough. Uh, right. And so are you close? <laughs> well. <laughs> where, uh, where are we here? I I think we are close. I mean, it's it's always progress is a function of uh, capital and talent um, and to some extent resources. But in our case, it's it's capital uh, first. And then um, we have the talent, um, you know, electric fusion systems dot of com. It's got the website and all the, the people. But you also need to do this delicately. You need to prove it. You need to have replication and experts and papers. You need to avoid the uh, debacle of cold fusion of 1989, mm -hmm. where people uh, said they had a breakthrough of Pons and Fleischmann in uh, University of Utah, and nobody could replicate it. Um, they were onto something, though, weren't they? Yeah, they were onto yeah, something. They were like they got they got ripped very unfairly, I think. But they, you're right, they couldn't quite replicate it. Right. And, and that's what you, you have to do to um, gain credibility and have it um, be licensable and make it make it yeah. uh, effective. Um, and so that's really what we're working on. I mean, it, as far as when, um, I would say optimistically, we're um, we're inside, uh, you know, six months and pessimistically uh, a year. Um, okay. Well, that's so, a good I mean, account. Yeah. I mean, that's not bad. Yeah. And now the others, uh, other fusion efforts are 2030, um, 2035, 2040. Um, but the cost of electricity is no different than what it would be today. Um, you know, solar and wind are eating the lunch of, uh, of nuclear. Um, or coal, or you know, many of the other uh, energy sources. Now it's intermittent; it has problems and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, but from a dollars per megawatt basis, it is um, it's very competitive, and and, and more. You're profitable. saying your fusion model is very competitive. Well, my, our fusion model will be even more competitive more, than solar you're talking and about wind. Solar and wind is competitive. Yeah, exactly. So you know. For example, um, uh, just you know, 40, 40 milliliters of this fusion fuel um, is the equivalent of two hundred megawatt hours. Uh, it costs a dollar. Um, it's like uh, um, thirty eight thousand dollars worth of oil. So it, it's it's a total game changer. Um, people just have to believe it and come to the rarefied science of, of Rydberg matter. And um, they may. Uh, That's amazing. Well, and there's, uh, you know, economically, I'm, I'm no expert here, but I do know that there's a, a pretty clear inverse relationship between the cost of energy and economic growth in a society. So if you have cheap energy, you will have good economic growth. It's pretty straightforward. If you have expensive energy, you are very unlikely to have good economic growth. Right. 
So yeah. uh, there's that as well. And plus uh, environmental factors and everything else uh, sounds like a, a win. So yeah. No, it, I want this to succeed. Right. It is what they call anti-neutronic or without neutrons, radiation free um, energy development. Right. Um, right. Not the and, dangerous kind. Yep. So. Well, good luck, Ryan. Uh, what a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm very glad we got to talk about Magic Eyes Only. Glad we got to chat a little bit about your other book, The AI Ufologist, which is a neat book. I agree. I You gave me a copy of it, and it's enjoyable. Uh, but I will not lie. To me, this is uh, the book that anyone seriously interested in the UFO, UAP subject really needs to become familiar with. Uh, I'm going to have a link. I'm shamelessly plugging your book. I don't care. People yeah. can say what they want. I love this book. I'll have a link there. And your primary website, is it still Majestic? It's uh, magic, M-A-J-I-C, eyesonly.com is where that book is. They're both I'm up on to. Amazon. And majesticdocuments.com. And there's even the uh, specialoperationsmanual.com, which just focuses on the authenticity of the special operations manual. Oh, good. I'll have links below for all of those. People should uh, check them out. They are, uh, I'll just say this, the Majestic Documents um, thing, that's a rabbit hole. Once you go down, you're in it for a long time. But my God, how fascinating it is. The documents are, are uh, they are fascinating. Yep. They Thank are, you they so are all much, Richard. Um, it's great to reconnect. Oh, same here, Ryan. Uh, well, I, I'm very confident you and I will be in touch throughout the year. I'm looking forward to it. I'm very glad that you're, uh, you're back with this book. Uh, the, your first edition was out of print for a little while and I was forlorn. I kept wanting people to get the book and it was uh, not easy yeah. for them to, to spend $250 for a used copy. Right. Which is what it was. Yeah. So now they can get the new one, the expanded version and uh, yeah. the world is good again. So excellent. Thank you, Ryan yeah. Wood, for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, uh, listeners. Uh, hey, if you like this program, hit the like button. You know what to do. Subscribe to my channel. Uh, if you really like what I do, please go visit my website, richardolanmembers.com, where I do this type of work all the time. We've got a great community there. Amazing people over there. Uh, very active. We've got a community, in other words, and uh, I invite you to go check it out. I have a lot of free content there as well. So that's at Richard Olin Members. And that's it for now. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Catch you again soon. In the meantime, let's keep fighting the good fight. Later.